Now, on to the computer programme, and the second of ten programmes that demonstrate the workings of modern computers. Welcome to the second episode of the computer programme. Now, it's a drip-dry shirt, so we want... Where today, apparently, we're looking at Chris do his washing. Half a spin symbol and programme E. There we are. Well done, Chris. Now, if you've used a modern washing machine, you'll know what a programme is. The programme consists of a preset sequence of jobs. Water in, powder in, wash, rinse, spin, rinse, spin, and so on. You don't need to worry about it. Now, the steps a computer goes through may seem a lot more mysterious, but it's still a matter of just one thing after another. Yes, first airing on the 18th of January 1982, this is the second episode called Just One Thing After Another. And we're going back to the gloomy, I'm going to call ethereal macabre days of 80s television, where everything just seems a bit, a bit dark and dull, just filled with despair, a, a warming despair, like a void of despair, a warming void of despair. And we start, like most of these episodes, on location. Apparently at a factory, making chassis. First of all, they have the concept, then they design it, and of course then they face the problem of building it. I can't really hear you, Ian. The machine where you feed in steel at one end, plastic, rubber, and so on, wire, and out pops a car at the other end. Unfortunately, that's not really possible. So what they have is a production line, where a set of components are brought in under the control of a set of instructions <sighs> to produce a particular car. The world of completely unsafe 80s cars. I've just been watching some crash tests from the 80s. And my god, it is horrific. In a way, that's exactly how a computer works. Instead of components, you have numbers, characters or words that are controlled by a set of instructions to solve a particular problem. High-tech stuff going on in this factory. So each episode of the computer program was really aimed to introduce you to the world of computers. So this is teaching you about programming and it's using various real life situations to teach you about it. They want to test a sequence of instructions in a computer program to find out if they're correct. So the instructions on the production line are checked. If car leaks, then fix it and take it back. If it doesn't leak, then continue to the next instruction. I think it's just an excuse for these guys to get out of their office. Oh, we've got a Vauxhall. Lovely. Instructions, of course, is very important. Fit front-wheel drive unit and a front-wheel drive car must come before fit engine. Look at that. That is a shiny piece of... Components are all okay. Trash, is it not? Correct. There's one way of checking out the whole program, and that's test the final product and in this case it's pretty simple I've never been a fan of Vauxhall <laughs> it, <worked. laughs> oh, it does look splendidly 80s though doesn't it the word program is a well-chosen one for computers I mean there's nothing new about the word what it usually means is an ordered series of events at anything from an orchestral concert to a village festival an orchestral <laughs> concert to a village festival and they the first things that came to <laughs> But when we talk about programming computers, the word suddenly seems to take on a rather different meaning. I mean, if you think about a concert program, the list is just made up of pieces of music to play. And what you won't see is... I love that greenery in the background. And, a, and that washing machine just dumped in the middle. <laughs> and even by changing the instructions, a motor car assembly line won't suddenly start turning out pottery. But a computer seems to be able to do just about anything. Yes, it's very flexible. And, uh, play music. Oh, look at that. I love it. It'll give you your own personal telephone directory if you wanted to. It can even draw pictures. Oh, that is nice. Especially on the BBC. Wow. Now, Ian McNaught Davis, how does one machine manage to do all those different jobs? Well, very much as your washing machine was processing your clothes, 
What this is doing is processing information. The information is like your clothes. It moves information. I think he's taking the piss out of your clothes, Chris. It's going to produce different things like this. It sends information to this screen, which gives it a different colour, or it would send a signal to the, the uh, loudspeaker here to give different tones on the music, or it could send information out to a cassette recorder like this. And all it needs to do this is a sequence of instructions. And they're relatively simple and broken down. They can move information about. They can add one number to another. And, of course, the secret of a computer is that they can compare one number with another and then branch or move to other sequences actions after they've done that. Beautiful. In the case of all the examples we've seen, whether it's making pictures or making music or any of the other jobs that a computer do, can do, it's still always the same kind of information that it's moving about inside itself. Yes, but the program itself is broken down to these tiny little sequences, even for a colour picture like this. It's just really, it's just a sequence of if instructions, really, isn't it? Cool, though. I mean, can you give me an example of the kind of steps a computer would go through to carry out a complicated process like this one? Well, even a straightforward and simple job like sorting a stack of weights into order requires it to be broken down very simply. For a We've got some pounds there. Pre-metric weights. Heaviest on the right. Thank no you. effort in this, I don't think. No, there isn't. Yeah. Now that didn't stretch your credibility very much. <laughs> Did he click his fingers? He was like, "Yeah, I'm the man." How would a computer do it? Now, what you do? Start at the right hand end. Yes. Pick two up. Yes. If the one in the right hand is lighter than the one in the left, swap. Right. Yeah, so here we have, if this is heavier than this, do this. That's lighter. Swap. That's, he that's heavier. That's right, so correct. you've got the, already on the first pass, you've got the lightest down to set. I think when I used to write basic programs, 90% of what I wrote was around if commands, because you can do a hell of a lot with if commands. Right. And that looks about right to me. And that's how a computer would do it. That's exactly how a computer would do it, because the instructions are very simple. You know, if one is, if your right hand is lighter, swap and go on to the next pair. It's a very simple piece of code for an, a computer to understand. Look at that lovely BBC Micro just sitting on the table. Real life application. Of yes, there is, and I can show you that. We've got a little program here, sort. I don't think that was plugged into a TV. It only had the power wire coming out of it. Sequence, and we're going to sort them into alphabetic order. And every time they're out of alphabetic order, oh, listen to that music. It's around. And it's doing it by co just comparing. S so it's, 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 it's like from another world, isn't it? Each pair, if one is higher up the alphabet, but just slightly dark. Of course. We've slowed this down many thousands of times right. so we can see what exactly is going on. Of course, a computer is normally sorting... And all the 80s colours are more muted, which adds to that effect. A lot faster than that. What we were looking at there, yes, was a, a, an artificially simulated, slowed-down version of what really happens. How fast does it go in Well, fact? that one was slowed down thousands of times, but I think we can give you an idea of how fast it goes. It oh, is. It's, yes. I mean, it's less than a... Sorted, mate! <laughs> computer taking very very simple instructions. I'd love it if he be able to do them incredibly quickly. It's standard BBC micro voice when doing basically. speech synthesis was a cockney. <laughs> Ooh. In its own way, a computer goes about its job just like a very finely tuned piece of machinery. Now these automation machines uh blow my mind. The Violano Virtuoso. In a beautiful piece of machinery like this, the individual parts, the wheels, the levers... The Hell of a lot of effort to build one of these machines. ...quite easy to understand in themselves. I would probably think... ...makes the whole thing seem complicated. I would just hire someone to play the music. ...that you might not expect just by looking at it. Now, we're going to be talking about punched card, aren't we? I can see where this is leading. Or oh, Hollerith cards. Because, I mean, these machines were, what, about from, from the end of the 19th century? ...of paper punched with holes. It's a simple way of storing information. But it wasn't the first machine to use this system. To trace the beginnings of punched paper or cards, we have to go a lot further back in history and look at a more down-to-earth device. Some sort of garment machine. Well, 
think after a few 12-hour shifts, I'd really get to know how to operate this machine. Um, it's the famous Jacquard loom, and even though it was invented nearly 200 years ago, some of the principles in it are still in use in modern computers today. It's like a vintage piece of gym equipment. Using this machine, it's possible to produce any pattern that you like, even a beautiful pattern like this. All I hope that you just made that. Different combination of these warp threads have to be lifted every time the shuttle goes across, and we gradually progress down through the cloth. Well, one way of doing it, of lifting these different combinations, was to have a small boy sat at the top of the loom, and every time the shuttle went across, <laughs> he would pull up a different combination of these threads. <laughs> just pop a small boy up there. <laughs> and subject to errors, but it did work and was used. But that's where Jackhard made his breakthrough. He devised one method of getting information into this machine which would do exactly that job. And that information was stored on these punch cards. It was, in essence, a very simple idea. Go on, make them all fall down. <laughs> make the machine fall apart. There was no hole, it wouldn't be lifted. So each time a card went through, a different combination of threads would be lifted and the pattern created. That is very impressive, isn't it? I mean, to come up with this concept... Absolute genius. I, it's kind of weird to think that computers used something as tangible as punched card to read data and store data in the early days. It's like an amalgamation of worlds. Weaving is just one example of a binary or two-way system. Now the point with weaving... The, you never expect things... You can never expect things in these programs. You never expect to go into this program and to be talking about weaving. For each thread, the number of patterns which can be made is almost infinite. Let me show you how it works. With one warp thread, either up or down, the weft thread crossing it can either go <laughs> weft? under or over it. Two possible routes. With two warp threads, the weft can go one of four weft ways. It just doesn't sound like a proper word. It sounds like a speech impediment. Other, over the first one and under the other, or over both. Every time you add a warp thread, the number of possible combinations doubles. So that with eight threads, and we've had to lay them out in four columns because the possible Man, I can see why I was so drawn in by computers. Oh, <laughs> deadly serious as well. I mean, the, 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 the world of creativity and things you can do just must have seemed limitless. Well, instead of threads, of course, they're electrical ons or offs. I quite like to think of them as pots. What? Is, what, is, what? is that why there's a pot behind his head? And, uh, what is a pot? The shelf, some of which have. I see. OK, we're talking about pots. And in this particular computer, they're in grouped in eights, so you can get the 256 combinations. And each combination represents what? A different number? Well, a number or a special symbol or an alphabetic character or even a command. For example, this one, empty, empty, full. Empty. You can see what these programs are trying to do with their explanations, but as a kid, I would go away from this program and not have a clue what had just happened, really. Or how it related to a computer. I mean, they're talking about pots. It could be just the letter A, or it could be a command, for example, A meaning add, to add two numbers together. Right, and a, an ordinary personal computer like this one would use all 26, 256 of those. Yes, all 256. Right. It must have been a hard concept for school kids to get their head around. Patterns is actually surprisingly something quite familiar to us, as our reporter Jill Neville has been finding out. Oh, she's on the streets of London. As you slow down for traffic lights. Oh, where it where it's filled with old vans from the 80s. It's obeying an instruction in binary code. But then black taxi cabs never change. Traffic lights at all, and why should you have done, you probably thought of them as a simple colour code. Red means stop, green means go, and so on. But there's another way of looking at traffic lights. <laughs> yeah, just racing straight through them. <laughs> completely colourblind. Each of the lights has a definite position and can be either on or off. And according to the different combinations of on and offs, so the meaning changes. The three lights can be combined in eight different ways, but of those combinations, only four mean anything to drivers. If the top light's on, you stop. If the top two lights are on, you get ready to go. And when the bottom one's on, you go. And the cycle continues with the middle what's, light. What's she driving? Is that a Renault 14 she's driving? My word. 
computers also work in binary, so not surprised. Oh, look at them. I've got a Vauxhall, what's that? Is a Vauxhall Cavalier there? Look at all these old cars. It may seem as you struggle through the traffic. Wow. All these traffic lights on every street corner. Oh, that's a Cavalier, isn't it? ...to get the majority of cars to their destinations. First one was, what, an Austin? And if things seem bad, well, they'd be a whole lot worse without that computer in control. In London, the traffic light system's controlled from New Scotland Yard. We're looking at the cameras at the moment, which are covering the Euston Road from the Euston underpass right over to the Pentonville Road. Big Brother, working since 1984. The computer is programmed to bring in the maximum eastbound or uh, into town bias for the morning peak, and then it changes off to the off peak at about 10 o'clock, and then the evening. Whoa, where's that guy going in the background? Right through the 24 hours of the day. From his position at just flies off the screen. The can change the pre-programmed sequences of lights to speed the flow. If there's a heavy build-up of traffic, he can switch the computer to a contingency plan designed to increase flow in one direction. The plan which is put in for this time of day isn't sufficient for that, so uh, I could put in a contingency which would increase the... Do it. Put in a contingency. contingency. Eight, ...which uh, controls the whole of the east... All that traffic powered by um, technology. By putting in the... Which the could barely run a blender. ...plan, which gives it a, you know, seven or eight seconds on, the, on all the... A Siemens monitor there. Very nice. It should clear that backlog. Altering the sequence at What's that bloke carrying on the right? Lights ...has a marked effect on all the roads radiating from it, and the timing of the other lights in the area has to be adjusted accordingly. It takes a computer... Is he wearing like a, a swimming pool float? Traffic moving. Now, obviously, keeping London's traffic moving is an immensely difficult task and something that a computer is well suited to do. But it's still only just doing one thing after another, isn't it, Mac? Yes, it is. They can only do a relatively limited number of things. And in fact, the instructions can only be put together in a limited number of ways. In fact, only three ways. They can be executed or followed in a sequence, just done one after the other from beginning to end. Or you can execute a sequence of instructions and do it again and again a certain number of times. Ooh, a loop. The exciting bit, which makes a computer seem to have some sort of intelligence, it can test whether a condition is true or false, and as a result of that test, can do either one set of instructions or a different... Yeah, this is why I love computers. They sound a little bit like cooking, in that there only are a very limited... That is exactly what I was thinking, Chris. It look, it sounds a bit like cooking. Roast or fry them. Yes. His analogies are incredible. Combining the instructions in different ways, there's no limit to the number of dishes you can make. Take making mayonnaise, for example. The there was ten episodes in this series, and they ran from the 11th of January 1982 to the 15th of March 1982. So, but school kids didn't get overloaded with the amount of references and strange, almost cerebral ideas. Then you drip the oil into the egg a drop at a time and whisk the mixture. Now you're performing that group of processes over and over again. Drip, whisk, look at the oil. Drip, whisk, look at the oil. Until the oil is finished. If the mayonnaise curdles, you put in another egg yolk and go back to dripping in oil again. And those instructions are only to be performed if it curdles. Otherwise, the mayonnaise is finished. Okay, I write that in basic. What I liked was the programming language logo, which came around with BBC Micros. Computer. Where you could draw things using the turtle. A program we have stored in the machine. In other words, it's a list of instructions. This has been pre-done. This is what pre we did. Yes, okay. just a couple of lines yeah. of a program. In other words, a list of instructions that... Okay, now we're applying the real world world scenarios to programming. Could have been one and two, yeah. but you usually number them 10, 20, because you might miss one out and forget a line, you want to slip a line in there after. So you could say 11, 12, 13, 14. Yes, you, know. you could yeah. do. Yes. yes. And the first one is print. And inverted commas... Look at his bling. Look at his watch. ...conversation in a book. If it puts in inverted commas, it means it's conversation. So the that tells the computer to actually print where is the Vatican question mark on the screen when you run it. Okay. So when you run the program, that's what you get. That's all you get is where is where's the, Vatican? the Vatican. For that one line. That's okay. right. Yeah. So that's fair. I'm pretty sure that Chris is intentionally acting dumb when we go through these because 
I think he's pretty clued up on all this stuff. Hence why he's the presenter of this program. I don't well, understand at all. <laughs> that's much more complicated. Again, that's, an, that's a basic command, input. And what it's saying is, I'm asking you to input something into the computer. It's calling for input, which is put in on this keyboard. So it, that's a computer talking to me? Effectively, it will do. I'll show you how it runs in a minute. All right. Now, when you input something, it needs to know where to locate it in its memory. And we're calling this here city string, which means it's expecting you to input some alphabetic characters. Where's the Vatican? It's going to be a word you're that's going to That's what that in. dollar sign means. And that's what that curious little nasty dollar sign Again, that's, that's something that's part of this basic language. That's right. right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if we run that... And um, get <laughs> it does look like he's genuinely struggling with a concept, though. Try it out. So you just type run. You type run. Yeah, so and that's all you need to do. All right. And return. So there it is. Where is the Vatican? Yeah. And when, but, yeah, when this was new, if this is new to you, to a school kid, so it's, it's easier for kids to take this on board, but I now, I don't think we should the older generation... They'd like to look at the programme. It must have been such an alien concept. So escape from the programme. There's a little yeah. key here. It's like okay. escape from Stalag, whatever it is, and bang. Yeah. And that gives the escape from where we were, which was line 20. Right, so we've interrupted the... We've interrupted uh, the, the programme. Program. Now, I think we should list it, and we can just... Another basic command is just type list, which will list the programme for us. Press return again. Return again. Okay. And that's the whole programme, the first two. And on line 30, we've put... So he, he, he knows his way around the keyboard. If he wasn't savvy on this sort of thing, it would take him about half an hour to find those four buttons. This one, I've said, if what you've typed in... So here's some if statements. I love if statements. Not equal to Rome. Yeah. Then print wrong. I wrote a um, an artificial intelligence program. I've done it in a previous video. As we did. Where is the Vatican? Which was mostly just built around if statements. And if you type an answer, which isn't the correct. I mean, in terms of artificial intelligence, it was terrible. But get me entertained. So we can write a line. Would you like to write another line to say? I think we could put in a line which would say what happens. No, um, I've got to type does a number, have Yes. Uh, 40, I guess. That's it. That's yes, it. Well done. Yeah. Than 30. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to let you <laughs> test this out. You're going to have to work yeah. this one out for yourself. Right. Well, presumably you have to say, uh, uh, if, this is funny business, if city dollar is Rome, then print correct or that's right, right well, or that's something. That's it, yes. Right. Except instead of is, type equals. Okay. Where is it? There it is. Yeah, there. Thing. Equals. Equals. In quotation marks, yes. I wonder how many years of my life were spent typing in these programs. Then. P. Right. T. Uh, I actually found a load I'd written in QBasic the other day. Well, it looks okay. Which and, uh, I will present to you in the future, in the near future, I would hope. Uh, run. Run again. Where is the Vatican? London. Uh, what do I do now? I mean, it hasn't return. responded. Return. Uh, return. I always have to the line. Wrong. Wrong. Well, that, that works. works. That works all right. right we'll run it again. The right Such a world of possibilities. <laughs> All right. Yay! It's a, it's a very simple little program, but it, 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 it gives you that warm feeling of having done something and understood something. Absolutely. And it is the basis of many programs. That if-then instruction is the real thing that separates a computer from a straightforward calculator. It can make. It's worth noting that Chris Searle is still alive and with us. Ian McNaught Davis, the chap on the right, he sadly passed away a couple of years ago. That's a very good feeling when it goes right, isn't it? That's, it certainly is, yeah. <laughs> so even at this simple level, the computer can be made to do something that seems almost intelligent. Of course, I know the Vatican is in Rome, but a school child might not. A series of questions from the computer, programmed in precisely the same way, could make an interesting and educational quiz. It reminds me of those um, programs designed to tell you what occupation you'd be suitable for that some of us did at high school and they always told you that you should join the military sponsored by the um, government maybe I think possibly oh, look he's got mastermind look at that bedroom that is perfect I'm not sure about the choice of posters but
beautiful. That is a beautiful sight. Well, he's got a uh, SG, Gibson SG guitar over there. Nice. Anyway, that was the computer program, episode number two. Just one thing after another. The next program is called Talking to a Machine, and join me next time as we delve into that. Thanks for watching. See you soon.